welcome to the meeting this morning. It's good to see each one that is gathered with us today. Welcome for everyone in our Lord's precious name. There are a number that are sick, and we pray that the Lord's hand will be upon them, that they will be raised speedily up to health and strength. I assume some others are away on account of the holiday weekend. Uh, so we're delighted that you're here with us in the Lord's house. After the preaching, there will be refreshments outside, and then following Sunday school, uh, there will be the lunch around midday or so. If you're able to stay, we encourage you to stay with us for that time. There will be no men's prayer meeting tomorrow on account of the holiday, but there will be the prayer meeting on, as usual on Wednesday. So the prayer meeting and Bible study as usual on Wednesday at 7. No meetings on Friday on account of the school holidays and God willing then next Lord's Day I'll be here to minister God's Word and being the first Lord's Day of October next Lord's Day we'll be meeting around the table after the preaching in the morning time and the rest of the announcements are in the bulletin I should have mentioned that God willing tonight I am hoping to bring some principles uh, in guiding us in relation to the upcoming voice referendum uh, so we encourage you to come back and join with us for that time this afternoon at five to pray for that meeting in the lord's word i want to read from lamentations chapter 3 lamentations chapter 3 and verse 22 lamentations 3 Verse 22, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. And the Lord's mercies, the Lord's compassions are new every morning. He is a faithful God, and therefore on this Lord's Day morning, we come and we give thanks to the Lord that he is our portion. Our hope is in him, our joy is in him, and may we be enabled then to worship the Lord around. We'll seek the Lord's face together briefly in prayer. Our gracious Father, we give thee thanks for this day, and we thank thee for the Lord's mercies that enable us to come to gather for worship and we ask that the Lord's help will be granted to us that we may be enabled to worship thee aright. Give help from above we do pray and come and minister to every waiting soul we pray in our Lord's great name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing together from the words of the hymn number 70. The hymn number 70 on the page 203 the hymn number 70 on the page 203 immortal honors rest on jesus head my god my portion and my living bread the hymn number 70 page 203 will stand as i sing this <laughs>
face again, please, in prayer. Let us look to the Lord again for his face. Our gracious Father, we rejoice in the person of thy dear Son. It's in his name that we draw near to thee today. O oh Lord, we thank thee for the one upon whom all honours well. We thank thee for the one who is our hope in life and death. We thank thee for the one who is our living bread, for the one who is our shepherd, our guard, our guide, for the one who gave himself for us, that his love has been shed upon us. And we thank thee for our standing today in him. And we thank thee that as thou dost look at the people of God, despite all of our failures, our sins, our flaws, we thank thee that as thou dost look upon thy redeemed people, we are accepted in him. That as thou dost gaze upon us, thou dost gaze upon thy dear son. His righteousness is ours. O oh Lord, we stand amazed at the wonder of the gospel. What we had earned was everlasting destruction. But we thank thee for our acceptance in Christ. And O oh Lord, we pray that the wonder of that gospel will strike our hearts in this time together today. O oh Lord, we pray that we will see him. And in seeing him, that we will be more like him. O oh Lord, we pray that we will progress in this road of sanctification today that we will indeed through the word be made more like our lord we pray that we will be delivered from the flesh and the more and more that we will put on the new man O oh lord deliver us from carnal earthly reasoning and give us the very mind of christ we pray O oh Lord, we pray that you will be pleased to minister to any in our meeting today that are still unconverted. O oh Lord, we pray that hearts today will be opened and that you will draw the unconverted to yourself. O oh Lord, we do pray today that those that sit in our company that are still lost and without thee, Touch their hearts, we ask, and bring them to thyself. O oh Lord, we commend our land to thee, and we pray, Lord, that thou wilt have mercy upon it. How far this nation has strayed from the things of the Lord. And Lord, we cry to thee that there will be a mighty move of the Spirit of God upon face of this land. We thank thee that thou hast pledged that the gospel will go to the nations. And Lord, we cry to thee that in our time that the gospel will triumph in this land. O oh Lord, deliver us from the superficial. Deliver us, Lord, from a, a carnal Christianity. Deliver us, Lord, from mere emotionalism we pray lord for a faith that is grounded upon the word of god and that has the fire of the spirit of god upon it oh lord we long for orthodoxy give it more give us more of it we pray lord we pray that it will not be the dryness of the letter but rather that the power of god will be known here and throughout the land and to that end Give us a little reviving in our gathering here today. May there be a 
a little time of heaven as it were on earth in our gathering together. So we commend ourselves to thee. Uh, we commit the sick to thee. We pray that your mighty hand will be upon them and the sick will be raised up to a fuller measure of health and strength. And uh, we pray that the congregation in its entirety uh, will know a time of blessing over this holiday weekend. We pray that every family uh, will be drawn closer to one another, but most of all, closer to thyself. And we pray in our Lord's great name. Amen. Amen. We're going to turn again in our hymn books, please, to the words of the Psalm 126. It's, well, I found it on page 122. Page 122. Psalm 126. When Zion's bondage, God turned back as men that dreamed were we. And I believe that the original setting of the psalm relates to the desire of the Lord's people to be delivered from the bondage of the exile in Babylon. And as they would go back to Judah, and they would go back, they would sow in tears, and knowing that the sowing of the seed uh, would result in a time of hunger. But then there was going to be the joy that would follow. But the words point us forward to Christ himself. He is the man that has come bearing precious seed. He will doubtless come again bringing his sheaves with him. In Psalm 126, we will stand as we sing these beautiful words. Please. and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Saviour. We will have all men to be saved and to come on to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Whereunto I am an ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. I will therefore that men everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, 
In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. And we'll end there knowing the Lord will bless the reading of his word. And we came to these words systematically, so we're putting them to tie in with the holiday weekend, the king's birthday. Uh, verse 1, it talks about different aspects of prayer, intercession, giving of thanks, supplications, prayers, and in that list of what we are to pray for in verse 2, for kings and all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life. And we are to pray then for those that are in authority, of course, that it would be for our good, that, that is their governance would be for our good, that we might be enabled as citizens to lead, to lead quiet and peaceable lives in godliness and honesty. We're going to turn again in our hymn books. We're turning to the hymn 370. Please, the hymn 370. I love to tell the story of unseen things above of Jesus and his glory of Jesus and is love. 370 and we will remain seated at the beginning please as the offering for the work of the Lord is received. 370.
turn in the scriptures, please, to the Gospel of John and the chapter 7. Gospel of John, sorry, the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Luke and the chapter 7. We read about John the Baptist in the passage. Uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter 7. Luke's Gospel, chapter 7, and verse 24, please. When the messengers of John were departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John. What went ye out into the wilderness for to see? A reed shaken with the wind? What went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Well, they which are gorgeously apparelled and live in, and live delicately are in king's courts. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized. And the Lord said, Whereunto then shall I liken the men of this generation? And to what are they like? They are like unto children sitting in the marketplace, calling one to another and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned to you, Give not wept. For John the Baptist came neither eating, sorry, came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and ye say, He hath the devil. The Son of Man is come eating and drinking, and ye say, Behold, a gluttonous man, the wine bibber, friend of publicans or tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified of all her children. And then there, knowing the Lord will bless the reading of his word. We'll seek the Lord's face together, please, in prayer. Let us each pray that the Lord will today minister to our healing hearts. Our gracious Father, we thank thee for the living word of God. Our hearts need to be fed afresh. And we pray then that we will know fresh manna as we come to thy word today. O oh Lord, we pray that there will be here in these words a word for every soul. We think especially of those that have heard the gospel many times and yet they are still without thee. O oh Lord, we cry to thee that hearts will be opened. To the truth of thy holy word. Grant a help then we do pray in our Lord's great name. Amen. Amen. Now often today we encounter notions that are unreasonable, notions that are full of inconsistencies. We hear it all around us 20 or 30 years ago we were hearing we don't want to get married Couples should be allowed to cohabit if they so desire. Then, five years ago and more, we were hearing, no, we want to get married, and we must have the right to get married. And men must be allowed to marry men if they so please, and women marry women. We're often told religion is a crutch to lean on. And we want to abandon religion. We live in the age of science, and so we must ban the reading of God's word. We must ban prayer. But then the same people say, we want to spend thousands of dollars to open our event or open parliament with a smoking ceremony. 
We want to drive away the spirits. Some will say there must be equal rights for women, no pay gap and so on. But the same people don't know what a woman is, at least when they're asked, and no answer is to be given. They tell us it's hard to define. Now, inconsistency in society is one problem, but how much greater inconsistency in the heart of the sinner as he excuses his rejection of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord addressed that in this passage. Last time we saw that John, John, John the Baptist that is, he sent two messengers to Jesus with questions. After the messengers leave Jesus and go back to John the Baptist, our Lord then addresses the crowd. Because in the crowd there is a distinction. And many of the people having been baptized by John, they are saying that what Jesus has said about John is right. But then there are the, the Jewish leaders that reject that. Now before uh, there was this distinction, the Lord was asking the question, when you went to hear John preach, what did you go to hear? You didn't go to hear a man that was easily blown by every wind of doctrine and by every change in public opinion. You didn't go to witness a man who had a very lavish lifestyle. No, you went to hear a, a true prophet. The Lord said actually more than a prophet. And this is the one that the Old Testament spoke of as being the forerunner, the messenger of the covenant that would precede the great coming of our Lord Jesus Christ himself. And so in verse 28, the Lord says, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. And yet, in a very amazing way, the Lord says the one that is least in the kingdom, the kingdom of God is greater than he. How uh, can that be? What the Lord is showing is that John was pointing to the coming of Jesus Christ and he was able to say, Behold the Lamb of God. But before Jesus Christ actually did die and was resurrected, John himself was dead. And so John was looking forward to the work of Christ, but the one then that's least in the kingdom of God today we have this added blessing that John did not have, where we can actually speak of how redemption has been accomplished. In that sense, there is to us greater revelation. Now, Jesus spoke these words to make it abundantly clear that the ministry of John was valid, that John was indeed that forerunner. And it brings out these two responses that I've mentioned. In verse 29, there are those that justify God, and so it shows us that the very words of Jesus are the words of God. They justify God being baptized with the baptism of John. But then there is this division, because in verse 39, the Pharisees and the lawyers, they reject the counsel of God. They reject the words that Jesus Christ has spoken. And Jesus then pictures children playing in the street or playing in the marketplace. And as children do in their play, they often mimic or they, they imitate some of the practices of their parents or other adults. And so the things that they see so often, they now imitate them in their play. And in those times, when there was a wedding, there would be musicians hired to provide music, joyful music. And so at the wedding, there would be this joyful music. And perhaps you can picture the children in the mind in your street. And somebody says, I'm the groom, and you're the bride, and you're the friends of the groom. And they're saying to the other children, come on and join in, we need 
children to dance. There are some children, they say, no, we don't want to play that game. We don't feel like dancing today. We don't feel joyful. And so they change the game. And instead of playing wedding, they play a funeral. And so those that are piping the music, they're playing a different tune now. It's a dirge. And so some are imitating perhaps the carrying of the coffin and the weeping of loved ones. And they call to the same children, come and join us. And the same children that wouldn't join in the dance and the song, they say, no, that game's depressing. What type of a game is this? We're not going to join in. And so we're being given this picture of children that are sulking. It's repulsive behavior, isn't it? You can never please them. No matter what you would do, they are never happy. And the Lord says, that's just like this generation. It's not just the children that are incorrigible. But you Jewish leaders, you're exactly like these children. When John the Baptist came, you regarded him as very austere. You said, he's always fasting. And when he does eat, it's this unusual food, the locusts and wild honey. He doesn't dress very nicely, wearing the clothes from, from a camel. What an odd man. Too rustic, he doesn't come and live in town. He stays out there in the wilderness. And they say the only explanation for why John lives the way he does is he must be demon possessed. He has a devil in his head. But then when the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ began, they looked at Jesus and they said, well, he's always talking about deliverance. He's all about bringing joy. There's all of these miracles of restoration. And they said there's too much talk about blessing. <coughs> and he doesn't act quite properly. He spends time with the lessers of society, the people that we don't like. And the Lord is saying then, it doesn't really matter who preaches the gospel to you people. It doesn't seem to make any difference what their manner is, whether they are bringing the rigors of the law in their preaching or whether they come with tenderness. As the salvation of God is preached and salvation is offered, no matter who preaches it, you won't have it. You refuse it. You're like those children. You're never satisfied. There's no pleasing you. And what the Lord is speaking of then here does relate primarily to how we embrace the gospel itself. Of course, there is a, a wider application, isn't there? Where we as the Lord's people are not to be a people who can never be pleased. In these days there's a danger of online watching at home. There are some of them forsaken the public gathering of the Lord's people. And they stay at home and they follow one ministry for a while. And then one day the preacher says something they don't like. And suddenly the man that they were talking to everyone around, well, he's no good anymore. And they move on to a new ministry. And now they're saying, this man, you've never heard the like of him. What a wonderful preacher. And two or three weeks later, he will say something they don't like. And they move on to someone else. It's a similar type of attitude. As we've said here, that the matter of hand is, Refusing salvation out of unreasonableness. 
and we want to look then at unreasonable and perverse sinners. I want to say first of all the effect of sin on the nature of man. The effect of sin on the nature of man. For as the Lord is portraying this generation as he describes it in verse 31, what is this generation like? As he goes on to describe them, we have to say that, that this is not how God created man. God did not create man to be unreasonable. God did not create man to be grumpy. God did not create man to be inconsistent. God created man in his image. And as God created man in the image of God, we have to remember that God is never inconsistent with himself. God is never inconsistent with himself. And God did not create man then to be this perverse and unreasonable creature. God created man to live for God's glory. And so the first great commandment is love the Lord thy God perfectly. God created man to serve one another. Love your fellow man. And so as God created Adam and Eve, in their unfallen state, there was this consistency. They loved God. They loved each other. But when they took the forbidden fruit, when sin came, what a change. A man now, instead of living for the glory of God and serving his fellow man, man is now selfish. Don't we see that immediately after the fall, where when God comes to talk to Adam, Rather than Adam coming and confessing what he has done, there's the shifting of blame. There's the blaming of the serpent, then Adam blames Eve, and he also in fact blames God who made Eve. Because the fall has brought this fall upon mankind where there's this obsession with self. And where there's obsession with self, there will follow the most unreasonable thought process. When sinners obsess with themselves, they form the most bizarre reasoning. And recently I heard someone say, life is short. Uh, maybe you've heard people speak like this, and I was thinking, well, that sounds good that you've come to that recognition. Life is short. But their next words were, so we have to fill it up with all the things that we can enjoy now. What unreasonableness. Life is short, but eternity is not. But no, let me just fill up my short life with meaningless things. I'm thinking about the Pharisees. Their complaint is, John is fasting. And yet we know from the parable of the public and the tax collector and the Pharisee that the Pharisees themselves delighted in fasting as long as people knew that they were fasting so their problem with John really isn't so much the fasting then is it they just want to complain about something and so since John lives a lifestyle that is rather different we have to have some complaint. And then we think of the ministry of Jesus. I'm sure they would not really have wanted to have said, We don't like joy. We don't like blessing. But they have to have some complaint. And so they say, Well, he's eating with the wrong type of people. He's a wine bibber. He's gluttonous. A friend of publicans and sinners and it's as if the Lord is asking the question what sort of a prophet would you like what is the preaching that you would want to hear whatever answer they would give it would point back to this same unreasonableness and I'm pointing out to them that the source of this unreasonableness is the fall of man. That despite all of their religion, 
they had not overcome this complaint, this common complaint that was all. That man is a fallen being. And it's this fallenness that results in man being so hypocritical and inconsistent. And surely the outcome is that man is not a, a man in his unreasonableness. He has not got true contentment. At least Pharisees were not truly happy people, far from it. Remember how the prophet Isaiah said, The wicked are like a troubled sea, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. A troubled sea when it cannot rest. There is no peace. There is no peace, said my God, to the wicked. And the guilty man, whether he is religious or not, he has this heart that's like a troubled sea. His heart is being stirred up continually. He never has true peace. There's no lasting contentment. And it's because no answer has been found to his problem of being a lost yes. sinner. Remember Nicodemus was a Pharisee. <laughs> and in John chapter 3 we're introduced to him. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And remember how as Nicodemus came to the Lord, he was commending him. And so it was good that Nicodemus did that much. He said, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. But when Jesus heard those words, was he overcome by the glowing commendation? Was he blinded by the words that Nicodemus was saying? Not at all. Because the introduction to that scene is actually at the end of the previous chapter. At the end of John chapter 2, it says in verse 24, Jesus did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. And then John writes, there was a man of the Pharisees, Nicodemus. When Nicodemus came, the scriptures have already told us the Lord knows what is in man. And the Lord did not need anyone to sit down and teach him about the nature of man. He knew what was in man. Now sometimes, dear unconverted one, your unreasonableness is manifested to men. And so I'm sure as the Lord spoke these words, those that were genuinely converted, they could reckon, recognize that what the Lord is saying is true. Sometimes you're unreasonable, this is manifested to men. But it's more important that you see this. Everything about your unreasonableness is manifested to God. None of your unreasonableness is concealed from God. For maybe after this scene, some of these Pharisees and lawyers, they would try to explain their inconsistency. And they might be able to produce what some would find is a plausible explanation. Of course, it wouldn't be. But they could come up with some, what would seem a plausible explanation. But God knew their unreasonableness. If you look at verse 30, it says the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves. If you have a margin, you'll see that those words can also be translated. They rejected the counsel of God within themselves. And so the idea is not only as they rejected that, they did so to their own detriment. And they were adding as where sin to sin. They were adding testimony against themselves. But also, the Lord knew what was in their heart. As we read elsewhere in the Gospels, Jesus knew their thoughts. The Lord knows your unreasonableness, dear unconverted one. And as John the Baptist came preaching the law, as he came preaching the rigor of the law, as he spoke of the severity of judgment, 
You ought to pay attention to that message. But praise God for the preaching then of Jesus Christ. Where Jesus Christ came with that welcome. Flee from the wrath that is to come and come to Jesus Christ. What blessed words these are that Jesus Christ did come to be a friend of publicans and sinners. And Jesus Christ is not only willing to sit down with you, sinner, but he will receive you. He will transform you. Of course, that's the matter that these men so often ignored. He will transform you. You need to come then to Christ. You need to leave your sin and come to Christ for mercy. We see the effect of sin in the nature of man. I want to see with me, secondly, the necessity of the operation of the Spirit in the heart. And since man by nature is unreasonable, and since that unreasonableness will cause him to make every excuse he can think of to refuse the offer of the gospel, and indeed the command of the gospel, the only way that this problem can be overcome is by the operation of the Spirit of God. Even the preaching of a faithful man like John the Baptist could not change the heart. There had to be the work done of the Holy Spirit in the heart. And so if you look at me at verse 29, all the people that heard him and the publicans, the tax collectors, justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. Now, we often look at that word justification and what the Lord does for us, and that is right. For the one that is born again, for the one that is forgiven, they are justified. What can it mean then that we justify God? God, of course, has no sin to be forgiven. The word justification, it has to do with a declaration. A, a, a declaration of righteousness. Or a declaration of rightness. And so going back to the justification of the child of God. When a man is justified, when a woman is justified, there's this declaration. They are right before God. That's what justification is. What is it then to justify God? It is to say that God is right. Now it's not making God right. God is right, no matter what you say. But to justify God is this declaration. God is righteous and he is right in what he does. And so those that are justifying God on this occasion, they are saying it was right that John came preaching the message of repentance. It was right that John would preach of the fierceness of the wrath of God. It was right that John would preach of fire, just as Jesus did. It was right that John would point to the Lamb and show that there is mercy. Repent of your sin, turn from it. John did not say, turn to me. John was saying, turn to this one that is greater than I. And the crowd was saying, it's right that when Jesus came, that he would preach about to us, that he would bind up the broken heart, that to the poor the gospel would be preached. To put it another way, it's right that the severity of the law would be preached, and also that the glad tidings of the gospel would be preached. And those that hear Christ defending these things, they say, yes, that is right. They justify God. They declare God is right. That it would be right for God to destroy the sinner. And it is. But it is right that God is a God of mercy and salvation has been provided. We come then to verse 35, which are words that some have looked at wondering what can these mean. Wisdom 
is justified of all our children. And remember, I've explained the, the meaning of this word justified. It, it has to do with this declaring that it is right. The wisdom in this context is speaking chiefly of the gospel itself. And so if we read it that way, the gospel is declared right by or of all our children. Those that have experienced the power of the gospel, they say, yes, it is right. Wisdom is justified of all our children, of all those that have come into the household of grace, all those that are children by adoption, that have come to see the great wisdom in the gospel of grace, that God has provided what we could never have even thought of, that the Son of God would take human flesh, that the Son of God would fulfill the law on our behalf, that the Son of God would bear away sin in his death. This is the wisdom of God. Wisdom is justified of all our children. You see, the Pharisees, they were suggesting, this is made, made plain elsewhere, the Pharisees, or sorry, the, the publicans, the tax collectors, the sinners, the prostitutes, they did not deserve salvation. In that, they were actually right. The publicans did not deserve salvation. The prostitutes did not deserve salvation, nor did the Pharisees, nor do any of us. But that's what grace is. It's to the undeserving. And so again, coming back to these words, wisdom is justified of her children. The children are saying, I did not deserve the very smallest portion of God's blessing and yet God's blessing has been poured out upon me I've experienced the mercy of God and the gospel works the gospel accomplishes the very thing that it is set out to do wisdom then is justified of our children in contrast as we think of the ungodly the ungodly say, I don't like your holy God. I, I don't like this justice that you Christians talk about. But they don't want an unfair God either. They say, I don't like this message about hell. They don't like a God who is all powerful. But they don't want, want a weak God who can't do anything to help them. And they don't like that God is all-knowing. That God sees everything in their heart, even their very intents and motives. But they want God to know about their problems. They want salvation from hell. But they don't want salvation from sin. They want to die the death of the righteous. But they don't want to live the life of the righteous. They want happiness. But they don't want holiness. This is the unreasonableness, the perverseness that the Lord is showing. But praise God, the Spirit of God is able to deliver sinners from such. And when the Holy Spirit of God comes upon the sinner... All of their foolish arguments are swept away. When that great conviction of sin comes, when men are brought to an end of themselves, but then their eyes are lifted to the sufficiency of Christ, they suddenly see things as they never saw them before. Praise God for the effective operation of the Spirit. And that is the great need of the sinner today. That is what the Lord was saying to Nicodemus. Ye must be born again. You don't need something superficial. 
You need a complete transformation. You must be born from above. As we come to a close, I want to bring just a couple of practical lessons arising this from the, for the Christian. Surely we are reminded in this passage <clears throat> that we as those that profess the Lord's name, we are not to be unreasonable. The Lord's people are not to be unreasonable people. In 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 2, it speaks there of how we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. The unreasonable and wicked men are those that are around us. The word that's translated unreasonable there it very literally has the idea of those that are out of place. But we are not to be like that. We are to be delivered from people like that. Philippians 2.15 That you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. And so Paul is saying, we do live among people that are crooked and perverse, as the word crooked suggests, the Greek word means, not straight, twisted. We live among twisted people. Again, the word is translated perverse. It has the idea of being distorted. Turned around. That is, turned around in a bad way. And so we encounter that every day. Every day we encounter unreasonable people. The Lord's word is saying that we are not to be like that. When we interact with people, whether it's in the workplace or the supermarket, wherever it might be, as we walk away, it should not be said of us, that person was so unreasonable. That's the world's way. We're to be delivered from it. But then I want to also bring a word of encouragement. The Lord can use our witness, despite our differences in personality and ability. Perhaps today you might be thinking, if only I had the ability of someone like Spurgeon or some other great character from church history, and they had such abilities and they were able to be used of the Lord then to convince people of their need and to be brought to Christ. We come here and we think of the ministry of John the Baptist. Who had ability greater than he? Who had the ability in the use of rhetoric as he? The, the ability to preach as he? He could preach like a hurricane, we might say. And yet there were those that sat under his ministry. And still they were hardened against the truth. were those even that heard the sweet words of Christ and they were hardened and so I go back to what I was saying a moment or two ago what is needed is the power of the Spirit of God and so no matter how you reckon your inabilities to be when the Spirit of God takes the weak instrument it's the power of God that is to be known. That's what we look for. As I close, the Lord is saying here, this generation, <coughs> to paraphrase it, you're so inconsistent, you're so unreasonable. We cannot say of Jesus Christ that he is inconsistent. We cannot say of him that he is unreasonable. Remember how in Hebrews 13 it says Jesus Christ the same. Jesus Christ the same. Yesterday and today and forever. He's always the same. 
There's this consistency, and again in Hebrews, but earlier in the book, Hebrews chapter 7, it talks about the Lord continuing ever. He has an unchangeable priesthood, an unchangeable priesthood, wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. And here, dear sinner, today there is hope for you. Because while you're changeable, and we all are, there is an unchanging one who is praying today. He is praying that sinners would be brought to him. And that prayer is heard. And it's our great desire that you would be brought to Christ today. Before the Christian, here we can hold on to this today. As we confess our unreasonableness, and we ought to. Praise God, there is one who is consistent. One that is never blown with the wind. He is always, as our high priest, making intercession for us. Praise God. And for that consistent Lord, may we then be those that are spoken of here. Wisdom is justified of all our children. May we say yes, the Lord indeed is right. We trust the Lord bless his word to our hearts. We'll sing some words as we close, please. Six hundred, sorry, four hundred and sixty-one. Four hundred and sixty-one. I am not skilled to understand what God hath willed, what God hath planned. I only know at his right hand stands one who is Savior. We'll sing the verses 1, 2, and 5. The verses 1, 2, and 5 will stand as we sing, remaining standing for closing prayer and the benediction. Please. <laughs> Like us in that he took our humanity, but unlike us in that he knew no sin. And oh Lord, we pray today that by God's grace that every believer will be made more like him. Oh Lord, speak to our hearts, we pray. Challenge us through thy truth. Lord, we pray for any still in their unbelief. Open their eyes, we ask, and draw the lost ones to thyself. We thank thee for the refreshments. Bless those to us and our fellowship together. And be with us throughout this day, we do pray. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Saviour, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever.